I mean, whether you wanted to or not, you just went downstream because everything flows downstream. Life is a mountain. Life is a climb. And to get to the good stuff, to get to the freshest air, you have to go up. To get to the, the purest water, the purest water is upstream. Hi, my name is Evan Herman, and I'm documenting my journey on becoming the best version of myself while learning how to be an entrepreneur and developing the successful habits that are necessary to get and keep me there. If you want to come alongside of me and make this journey together, we'll be listening and learning from some of the world's greatest mentors in the areas that matter most, faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, and fun. So join me on the Whole Person Podcast. Today, we have a gem of a human. He is a multi-New York Times best-selling author with the notable books, The Traveler's Gift and The Noticer. He is in a demand public speaker, as well as he's been asked to speak in front of past presidents and consultants of some of the world's largest organizations. So I want you guys to emotionally and mentally prepare yourselves for our guest, Andy Andrews. Andy, how are you? Good, buddy. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Now, your, your assistant told me that you have a new book coming out recently as well called The Bottom of the Pool. Yeah, it sounds kind of like a horror movie, doesn't it? Right. When I think of The Bottom of the Pool, I think of this time I high-dived off the diving board, and it was at an angle was the, uh, the, how it came down in the pool and smacked my forehead on the bottom of the pool. Yeah, so, man. You yeah, see, well, you went to the bottom of the pool a lot quicker than you're supposed to, I think. I, yeah. I, I did. I really did. So when I think of bottom of the pool, I think of that instance. But tell me, what, what is bottom of, the bottom of the pool? Yeah, this is a, a metaphor. It's, uh, you know, the subtitle is Thinking Beyond Your Boundaries to Achieve Extraordinary Results. And, and the story actually comes from uh, something that happened to me when I was 11 years old. I thought about it all my life. I, you know, I just remembered the time, but I never really connected it till a few years ago. But what happened was, it, this was during a time when parents can you know, leave their kids at, at, at a swimming pool all day, every day during the summer, and, and mine did. And, and we, were, we got so sick of playing Marco Polo and uh, all the different games that we invented our own. We, we called it Dolphin. You know, Flipper was on the air then. And the deal was to get in the center in the deep water of the pool and come up out of the water, see how high you could get out of the water. And, and there was this kid named Aaron Perry, and Aaron always won. He always won. It just drove us crazy. He won every, he had big feet, he had big hands. He could just get more water. He could get higher up above the surface than we could. And he won every time until the day my best friend just like destroyed him. I, I, my best friend is a guy named Kevin Perkins, and, and Kevin went to the middle. And, of course, we're, you know, most of us, we're so sick of it, we're almost ready to quit because Aaron has won every game. And so Kevin gets in the middle. He says, you ready? You're like, yes, go. And instead of going up, he goes down. And we're, we're little kids, and they're treading water, trying to figure out what is, what's he doing. He's, he's going down. And he went all the way to the bottom, squatted down. And before we could really even know what was going on, he pushed off the bottom and came rocketing out of the top of the water. And we're like, oh, my gosh, we have a new dolphin king, you know. Uh, and it was just it's this amazing moment. And, of course, uh, immediately Aaron and his little toadies start going, oh, you cheated, you cheated. And Kevin was like, yeah, where, where is the rule that says you can't go down before you go up? And we were like, yeah, where's that rule, right? And so we quickly agreed, okay, it's not a rule. And now we all get to do it that way. And soon Aaron was winning again. But, but you know, Kevin was the dolphin legend. But I thought about that for so long because, you know, we knew how to do it. Right? I mean, we were the only place on the planet this game was being played. We were the best dolphin players in the world. And we knew how it was done. We were watching the best. Aaron was the best. And, and we were the industry standard. And if you'd have come to us at that point and said, are you guys doing the very best you can? We would have said, yes, yes, we are. But what we didn't know 
is there was an imaginary line there we didn't even know existed while we were doing the best we were doing the best we could do we were not doing the best that could be done that was a whole different level of results and so watching kevin that day watching aaron and all that time you know i mean how to do this it was obvious we knew how to do everybody knew how to do it it was obvious how to do it at least it was obvious until one kid went down instead of up then what had been so obvious was no longer even true hmm. that's awesome it's a cool story because i, I you know it, it's something that really happened and i remember just kind of thinking about it through the years but i it wasn't until several years ago, I, you know, I work with a lot of corporate clients and work with teams and, and individual athletes. And it wasn't until several years ago that I began to connect the fact that there are things that you know, there are places we stop. We stop when we get an answer that is true. And, and, you know, when you think about it, why wouldn't you stop? It's true. It's the answer. It's right. producing results. Why wouldn't you stop? Of course you would stop there. And yet, there is another level of achievement that, that we never really go after because we stopped. We, we never even considered. It's like looking at, at Nick Saban right now. You know, here's, the, here's a, a, a coach who has won uh, – you know, he's won six national championships. He's won more college football national championships than every other active college coach combined. And so when you look at him, it's like, dude, where do you go for a seminar? <laughs> you know, I mean, right? I mean, who could, who could teach him? And, and so even in his own mind, anybody he brings in, what could they possibly tell him that he doesn't know? And so the challenge becomes in his own mind, how does he begin to believe that there's a lot more ground to gain? Hmm. And that's the thing that we, that's our challenge as parents and our challenge as, as spouses and as, as people, entrepreneurs and people trying to work and be citizens in our community. You know, a lot of this, let me put it this way. I feel like one of the biggest struggles in life is this idea of calling and purpose or even a certain level of achievement. You know, like I know that I'm called to live in such a way that is pleasing to God as well as to fulfill my responsibilities as a husband and a father. But I also feel like there's more. There's this longing and dissatisfaction within me about the mark I currently am making in the world around me and that it, that mark is not enough so in terms of the story in, in your book i guess my question is for those of us who feel like we're the average of what the industry standard is how do we go to living a life of significance or direction i know for me i guess my personal struggle would be um finding clear direction for for the purpose of my life or what a, that purpose even is. Right, right. It's a great question. And it's, it's one of those kind of questions where you, where you look and you think, you know, if, if there is this deep longing, if there's this thing in us that makes us want to, to do more, we sense that there's more, there's got to be a reason for that, right? I mean, that's, right. that doesn't just come out of nowhere. And, and so, I really believe that that happens to most of us, but I think that most of us don't know where to go with it. And so we tend to try to put it aside. We try to, to stop it, to stifle it, to feel like I'm being ungrateful and I should just be satisfied. And, and so here's what I found, Evan, is that, it, is that there are ways that we can approach and find the answer to what that feeling, to what that, that, that nudging is moving us toward. And I think the, the answers come 
with good questions. I think that uh, in, in most parts of our life, the quality of your answers can be determined by the quality of your questions. I think that uh, even, and I'm not necessarily even talking about questions uh, to wise people. I think that when we get alone with God and we get alone with our uh, ourselves and, you know, we find, we find ourselves alone with our subconscious, which is sometimes a scary thing for some of us. But, <laughs> but I think that when we ask questions, even of ourselves, our subconscious begins to work on those questions. And so I think that we can ask bad questions at times. And if the quality of our answers is determined by the quality of our questions, that means it's important to ask great questions. Okay, but and, and, and here's what I'm talking about. I, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example, but then I'll tell you exactly with this particular feeling. An, an example of a bad question would be somebody that says, you know, like I, I, I personally, I've lost a lot of weight in the past. Okay, so I remember asking a question that turned out to be a really bad question, which was, why am I so fat? You know, man, why am I overweight? Why do I have a hard time with this? Why? And man, my subconscious would go to work. Bad question. Subconscious goes to work going, well, you know, you have no discipline. Your mother was that way. I mean, all these things that, that come in there and start to confirm what we might think. But here, Here's an example of asking the same thing in a good question. And that is, how can I lose 50 pounds and regain the shape that I had 10 years ago, have fun doing it, and not be hungry all the time? Well, now there's a good question. There's one to set your subconscious on. Okay, so when we look at our own lives and we sense this longing for more, I believe we can ask good questions about that. And I think those questions can, can really, you know, in, in the book, I've got this book, The Bottom of the Pool, there is a whole section in there. In fact, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where it is. It's... Um, Chapter 10, page 67, Imagining Beyond Imagination. I think that, that we can begin to apply our imagination. And we can, you know, it's like with my boys. Sometimes I would ask them, I'd say, well, so tell me about this. And they say, well, I don't know. i say, okay, but I know you don't know. But just for a second, imagine you did know. And if you did know, what would the answer be? So a lot of times we can imagine what the answer would be in our own lives. We can look and we can say, you know, I know I'm not this. I know I, I, I need to do more. And I don't know what that more would be. But if I could imagine anything, if I had a magic wand, and I could step outside myself, just you know, like Samantha used to do on Bewitched. You know, she'd wave her arms and everybody in the room would freeze. And then she'd walk over and call Dr. Bombay or whatever it was. And, and so then she would come back when she had the answer and then animate everybody again. We can do that with ourselves. We can stop. We can uh, imagine. I, I do this all the time. I mean, this sounds crazy maybe, but it really works when you think, you have a situation you don't know how to deal with or you have a, a direction you want your life to go. Okay. It's been said that life is a chess game or life is a game or okay. So let's just uh, do a Samantha. Let's freeze myself and everybody. And I'm going to walk outside of myself and I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to build a glass little uh, container around myself, this whole situation, my future, and I'm going to get a glass of iced tea, sit in a lawn chair over here, and I'm going to watch it. I'm going to figure it. And I'm going to say, well, if I move the chess pieces over here, how would we? And, and I'm going to figure it. I'm going to imagine it. Because if you can imagine this, whatever this is, you can approach it. 
And you know, you, you mentioned God a minute ago, Evan. So think, think about this. Do you, do you believe that God wants his best for you? Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Do you want your best for you? Do you want the best for you? And that answer would be yes, right? Right. Okay. Well, as you imagine the best for you, and as God imagines his best for you, how big is that gap? So see, we yeah, how do we get closer to what God believes is possible in our right. lives? Well, and that's just it. I don't know. I thought at one point in time I did. Right. And, you know, to me, God has put me on a different path than what I thought I was on. And so now I'm in a stage of my life where, okay, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm fulfilling those roles and responsibilities with joy. You know, I'm, I'm living out my life as, as a Christian in a way that I hope is pleasing to God. Sure. You know, and I guess for me, I want to, to live a life of significance. And I feel like a lot of people are in that same boat. And I, when I say a life of significance, meaning that it transforms the world around me. And, you know, there's this idea with some people, oh, well, you need to be humble. You're, you're boastful. You're proud. You know, muzzle yourself. I can't do that. Like, I feel called to, to, to some bigger thing, but I'm trying to figure out how do I go from where I am to whatever that thing is and then go there. Buddy, you don't have to muzzle yourself to be humble. You know, you can show humility and still talk. And you can show humility and still have a vision for the future. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the idea that you can't talk or that you can't say what's going to happen or i mean that's just i mean think about how many times in the bible that somebody said hey here's where we're going this is what we're doing in fact uh you know it, a bunch of them said we are going to the promised land and then when a bunch of them said well no we probably should then i mean that's what made god mad <laughs> you know, I mean, it wasn't saying we're going. It wasn't pointing toward Canaan. It wasn't saying we are going to take this place. I mean, that's what God had for them. And so to be able to speak it into, uh, you know, into some kind of an awareness. And, and, and here's, here's the other thing, Evan, as I listen to you talk, I, I mean, I would want you I would want you to, to see that if you want to change the world around you, I would want you to understand that you cannot change the world around you without changing the world. Are you familiar with the butterfly effect? No. The butterfly effect was a doctoral thesis written in 1963 by okay. Edward Lorenz. And it was presented to the New York Academy of Sciences and laughed out of the place. And, and the butterfly effect basically stated that a butterfly could, could flap its wings on one side of the world and set molecules of air in motion that set other molecules of air in motion that moved other molecules of air that somewhere along the line created uh, a weather patterns on the other side of the world. The butterfly effect. It was, it was uh, finally in... Uh, in the mid-90s, proven by physicists working at colleges and universities as it is, is proven to be a fact. They give it the status of a law. It's, uh, it's now known in scientific circles as the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. And it works every time. Okay. And so, so the, the idea is that every move you make makes a difference. Every move you don't make spins the world in a slightly different way. And if you wanted to see, you want to have some fun with your own life, Evan, you know, if you looked and you said, 
th- there was somebody like for me, it was my eighth grade English teacher, uh, a little African American lady who told me I could write, who told me that I was kind of funny, and she changed my life. And I'm, so for you, I don't know who it would be, but but let's just say it was a teacher. Okay, if it was a teacher that really had a great part of putting Evan behind this microphone and with this giant voice, with this you know platform that moves around the world, if that teacher is responsible. Now let's look at that teacher and go, I wonder who is the person in that life who helped her become a teacher, him become a teacher. And then we look at that person and go, I wonder who is that well, right. if you can do that backward, you can certainly do it forward. Right. So I guess let me, let me ask you this then. How does a person get clarity of their purpose? Because, you know, there's this internal longing to do something. I thought I knew what that something was. And some people don't know what that thing is in their life. How, do, how does someone get clarity of purpose? I think clarity of purpose doesn't necessarily come with results. It can, you know, we, we, you know, sometimes results come later, but I think clarity of purpose can, can come with a, it's, it's what our, our moms and dads used to call our conscience, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that feeling inside you, um, you know, I had a Sunday school teacher tell me one time, I never have forgotten this. He said, you know, if, if you if you wonder whether something's right or wrong, you sit there and think about it, have to wonder about it, it's probably wrong. Because if it was okay, you'd know right away. But, you know, that nagging feeling where you're trying to have to, you know, rationalize with yourself or where And I, so I think, I think clarity of purpose can be a lot the same way. I think, you know, I've listened to you and I, you know, I, I see you when you sit down. I mean, you, you've got, you've got to feel like, man, I was born to do this. I was born to communicate. I was born to, you got to feel that way. Well, that's a, that's a clarity of purpose that people can have hammer and nails. It's a clarity of purpose people can have flying an airplane, catching a fish. You know, I've got a 17-year-old, and his clarity of purpose is catching fish. I mean, I wish I liked to do anything as much as he likes to fish. That's awesome. That's really, really funny. So... When it comes to decision-making in, in life, whether it's about your purpose or, or a job, vocation, a family member, because you were talking about just a few seconds ago, having to, to take a step and wonder, is this right or wrong? What are some basic principles that you've learned to use in your life about decision-making? I, I, I really believe one of the basic principles of decision making to me is what we mentioned before the quality of your answers can be determined by the quality of your questions and I want to ask good questions about my decisions I want to be principle based in my decisions I don't want to have to you know it I began to understand years ago Evan that if I can establish principles in my life then my decisions are much easier. I don't, I don't have to think about it a lot. I mean, I mean here's, here's an example, and this is, I, this, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this or anything, but this is just an example. Um, years ago, I, I used to do um, comedy. I used to do comedy concerts everywhere. I toured with Joan Rivers for two years and Kenny Rogers for five and used to do college concerts everywhere. Well, one of the things that I had decided early on is that I would not, uh, I would not do shows in front of a liquor banner 
um, you know, I wouldn't be sponsored by, or, you know, I wouldn't do shows on a stage where they're filming me with advertisements for liquor in the background. I you know, had uh, situations in the past with uh, family members and friends that, that just took them down. And I just didn't want, I just, you know, again, not trying to make a big deal out of it, but right. there came a day uh, when I was having a lot of success on the college market and uh, Miller light beer offered me a hundred thousand dollars to put their banner behind me when I would do these colleges. And now I was not even making a hundred thousand dollars in a year. And so it was a lot of money, but I didn't have to think about it because I had, I had already made that decision. That was not something I had to really consider. And so there are other, there are principles that we can establish in our mind. I'll give you another a, a stupid example. You know, whatever principles that were instilled in you when you were growing up, uh, you know, maybe your mom, your dad, your Sunday school teacher, your pastor, a teacher, I don't know. But whatever principles were instilled in you, they allowed you a decision-making process that, that most people are unaware of because they're not, um, what, what would you call, they're not very uh, um, intentional on establishing those principles, okay? They have some established, but... But if you can be intentional, you can broaden the area of your life that is much easier. Right. But the everyday person, there's principles established. And so, and so one of those that was established, for whatever reason, was that um, you would not rob a bank. Okay, right. that, was, that was established, right? And so when, you know, if there ever came a time that somebody came to you and said, Evan, you and me, man, let's rob a bank. There was never going to be uh, a time that you would say, well, let me talk to my wife about it. Well, let me pray about it. I mean, right. that was just a no. You, you didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to pray about it. There was a no. You had a principle established in your life about that, and it was a no. Well, the, the question is, why can't we broaden the territory in our lives and in the lives of our children, that we establish principles where life will be so much easier when we hadn't got to think about whether we're going to do this or that or that. I mean, there's so many things that can be corralled by a principle. Hmm. One of the, the things I, I learned recently, and you kind of reminded me of as we we're talking is, you know, there's this idea that I have in my life, like a, a personal mission statement. Right. But, you know, until recently, I never thought about making decisions based off of whether it moves me towards or away that personal mission statement. Right. Um, or, you know, to even go deeper than that, you know, sorry, I'm pausing because I'm just thinking, you know, there's within families, man. Sorry, I'm just getting so much clarity on stuff right now. You're, you're awesome here. <laughs> you know, in my marriage or in my family as a father or husband, we have these I ideas of what we want our family to look like, but rarely do we establish a, a plan or purpose for what our family is to look like. You know, it, I've noticed in my life, we just kind of drift and, and we drift in the ways of, you know, the stress or pressures of where we're at. Right. But I also need to get very clear about my family's purpose and the purpose that I have for my kids so that I can make decisions easier with them based off of um, those things according to that plan and purpose. So and I have a lot of purposes and plans that I need to figure out soon, I'm realizing then than what I just realized before. So well, it's it's a it's an important thing. It's an important process. And you don't, you don't want to be in a position where you drift. You, you, you want to be intentional. It's like I was telling somebody 
recently, I, I was saying, uh, my boys, I've got a 19-year-old, my wife and I have a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old. And when they were a few years younger, there was one Friday night that they came to me with, you know, pointing to something on the, on the little uh, handheld remote for the television. And they said, Dad, can we watch this movie? Can we watch this movie? And I looked at it and I said, yeah, yeah, you can watch it. And they were like, all right, all right. And and they're walking away. And I I said, if you really want to. And they turned around like, okay, dad, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I said, guys, you're old enough now that I am aware that you will soon be making these decisions anyway. And I, I mean, you know, there are times when I'm away from the house and I don't know what you're watching. You have to decide. And certainly when you get away from here and you're, you're, uh, functioning as an adult, you have to decide. You're not going to call me and ask. You have to decide. And so, you know, I'm fine with you deciding now. And so I'm just saying, yeah, you watch. You, as far as I'm concerned, you watch whatever you want to. I said, you gotta, you gotta think about it though, because it's it's your life. It's, it's not mine. It's yours. It's your future. And when you look at movies or books or time spent with people or music or uh, XM, I, I, don't, I don't know. When you look, you know, there are things that you'll look at and you'll go, you know, I definitely need to watch this. I definitely need to read this. I need to listen to this. This is this is going to be good for me. This is going to move me in a direction that I want to go in. This is going to help me. I need to, to watch this or listen to read it. And, and I said, and then there's going to be some stuff that you, that you look at and, and you should be wise enough that you go, I do not need to watch this. I do not even need to engage my brain or have my eyes see this because all I'm going to do is think about it later. And it's, this is uh, not going to move my life in a direction of my choosing. As a matter of fact, it may take up my time and my imagination and my energy in such a way that it slows my forward motion. Right. This is not good for me and I shouldn't, watch it or was it i say you have to make that decision but then there's this odd thing like this movie you're asking about right now because i look at this movie guys and this movie is not good and it's not bad it's just kind of there it's just kind of you know kind of a time waster you know i I mean it's funny it's not horrible i you know but but i but i asked him i said do you remember when we used to float down the Blackwater River. We would we would float down. It's, it's this beautiful sand river. It's very clear water. It's all about three feet deep, Evan, and, and it moves at about five miles an hour. And, you know, you get in your canoe or your inner tube. Or, it's just awesome. And I said, do you remember doing that? Yes, sir. I said, do you remember sometimes we'd stop on the sandbars and and we would really, you'd have to swim hard to swim upstream and if you didn't swim at all or, or you could you could swim downstream but if you didn't swim at all if you just kind of floated you went downstream i mean whether you wanted to or not you just went downstream because everything flows downstream life is a mountain life is a climb and to get to the good stuff, to get to the freshest air, you have to go up. To get to the, the purest water, the purest water is upstream. And so the good things 
take a struggle. The bad things, you can swim intentionally toward them. You can move intentionally toward them. But if you just sit around and don't pay attention at all, you're going to float downstream. And so not only should your movies and your books and your spare time and your friends be intentional, that's what makes your life intentional. Wow, that's good. I don't know if that's a quote or anything, but I'm, I'm taking notes and I, I wrote it. Life is a mountain and life flows downstream. You have to be intentional about where you want to go. Yep. I'm finishing writing that. <laughs> so let me ask you then, what was a time of struggle in your life and then the lessons that you learned from it? Well, there was a, there was a real, uh, a crazy time of struggle when I, I was 19 and my parents died. My mom died of cancer. My dad was killed in a car accident same year. And, you know, it, it was a crazy time and I took a couple of years to make it worse and ended up literally homeless before that was a word. You know, I was sleeping on the beach and uh, under a pier and in and out of people's garages. And so it was a, it was a, a crazy time, but it was also, it was also one of those times that, that almost seemed inevitable. Um, you know, this was before internet, before cell phones and, and it was one of those it was one of those times I, I look in my life and I, you know, now, I mean, it was years later that I would run into friends or whatever. And they would say, you did what you were where, you know, why didn't you tell us? And, and of course, you know, I'd left school, I quit school. And so I, you know, I had already been told by everybody that I was going to ruin my life. and. So when I'm homeless, sleeping under a pier, I certainly didn't go tell everybody, hey, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I said I was going to ruin my life. Well, look at me. I've done it. I've done it. You know, can you help me? I just wasn't going to do it. And, of course, without the Internet, without, you know, uh, cell phones, I mean, nobody knew I was there, and I didn't say anything. And I was working. I worked. I, you know, washed boats and cleaned fish and sold fish and guided fishermen and sold bait. and and um but it was a it was a time of stillness. Let me say that because every day, man, the sun went down, and the tourists all went indoors into their air conditioning or to the restaurants, and there were very few people on the beach and as the night got later and later, there were even fewer. And, and so it was, it was a long time of stillness in my life, of thinking, and uh, met an old man who started me reading. I, I actually wrote about that. There's a book called The Noticer. And in that book, the very first chapter is about me being living on the beach and this old man finding me and he started me reading and I eventually read over 200 biographies of these happy successful great people and 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 really used the power of those stories to understand I guess the the principles that they had engaged in in their life some some they didn't even know about but I had identified seven principles and and so those principles I you know I held on to forever and I kept learning about and working with and you know 20 years later they became the seven principles in the book the traveler's gift but all the, all that I I guess you know whatever it is that I am now whatever it is that 
I do. Um, the fertile ground was that time on the beach. Hmm. So you, from what I'm understanding, you say in that time, the biggest lessons that you learned came through stillness. You know, I think that's true. I think that, um, you know, I, I have recently become aware, I say recently, in the past, in the past 10 years, I have become aware of an odd fact in my life uh, that once I began to understand it, I was able to harness it. And here, here, Evan, this is the, this is the odd fact. You know how you uh, pray sometimes and you ask God, you know, please, please, give me, I need some answers here. I need, you know, help me. I, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble or I, I don't know what to do, or, you know, right. give me some guidance. And, and a lot of times we feel like, you know, that God is just being silent or, or whatever. Well, I determined uh, a few years ago that there were three major times I got answers in my life. Three major times I was getting amazing, very clear answers. Uh, one was when I woke up, you know, just like I, you know, after a nap or after sleeping at night or waking up in the middle of the night, but I, I would wake up and within 30 seconds, you know, I had gone to bed with, you know, some problem about some plot in the book. I didn't know how to figure that out or I, you know, something I did, didn't know how to deal with with one of our boys or something I, business wise. And I wake up, I have the answer. Seemed very odd to me, but it, that was one of the places. The, the second place that happened was in the shower. <laughs> and the third place it happened, uh, we, you know, my family were real outdoor people. And the third place it happened would be in the woods by myself. And it was very odd. I began to connect the understanding that those were the only places in my modern life where I was quiet, that I didn't have something going on, that I didn't have some, some outside uh, energy, some outside noise. There, there was nothing happening. And, and so I began to, to understand you know, if somebody came to you, Evan, and they said, Evan, I've got problems and I need help. And you're the only one who can help me. And you're the only one I'm going to tell about this. Please, please help me. Please tell me. Just tell me you'll help me. And, and you said, of course, I'll be glad to. And they said, thank you, Evan. And then they walked out. And then the next week they came and said, Evan, I just wanted you to know I'm still I'm still in trouble. If anything, it's a little worse. And you promised to help me, and I'm depending on you, and I need your help desperately, Evan. Please, I need answers. And you said, yes, I'll be, I'll be glad to. And they said, well, thank you. And they walked out. You would go, what the heck? I mean, I, you're not even letting me say anything. Right. And I am amazed in my life how many times I have prayed, God, please help me. God, please, I need an answer in this. God, please, please, I need to, God, please, I'm praying. I'm telling I'm, to God, I'm, I'm asking you. I de I'm desperate for help. Please help me. Amen. Okay, let me check my email. And I wonder how many times God has said, I would love to help you, but you got to let me talk. I would love to help you. But, but let me spend some time with you. You know, I, I, I've heard people say for years, um, you know, hunters say, I feel 
more, I feel closer to God in the woods than I feel in church. And I'll bet God's saying, I'll bet you do. It's the only time you shut up. Because I know in my life, those are the three times for a long time, the only three places I ever showed up. And so now I'm really learning, um, you know, to, to pray and be quiet and then say, okay, I'm just, I'm going to be quiet for a while. You know, and, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was no, just going to no, say, no. you know, one of the questions that I had for you, but I, I feel like you've kind of answered this. It, my question was going to be, how does Jesus impact your life? And obviously there's a lot of areas that he does, but through this conversation, you know, what you're saying reminds me so clearly of Jesus because how many times scripturally have we seen him early mornings leave the disciples and go be alone? Yeah. And early mornings are a big deal. Uh, They're hard. Okay. I know they're hard because everybody's tired and everybody's overworked and everybody's overwrought. And It's hard to get up earlier, but I will tell you this. The easiest time I ever have writing, the time that it flows the best, the time that I can connect and I just feel the Holy Spirit there and I feel... um, you know, my brain's working right is four o'clock in the morning before everybody gets up. And I have learned that what I do is I, I come down in my office and I, uh, I read my Bible a little bit, talk to God, quiet a little bit. And then I come over and I write and I don't check email and I don't check the news I come over and I do what I'm supposed to do. And, and I, have, I have found over and over that, that morning time is critical. And if you look at the history of some of the most productive people, you know, um, George Washington Carver if you just casually glance at his life, it is shocking to me that anybody could actually accomplish that much in a lifetime. I mean, I mean, knowing what I have to do to do what I have to do and knowing my body of work after 60 years on this planet, I look at Carver and I don't even know how it's possible to do what he did. And yet, if you read about how he did his work, he says every morning before the birds were awake, I would walk outside into the quiet and get my marching orders for the day. And you you can find a lot of examples in humanity of the people who somehow understood that. And I'm trying to understand it. <laughs> I paused there intentionally. I'm going to close the show here. Okay. Stay on after because I just have a few personal questions for you. Okay. All right. Andy, thank you so much for today. Uh, the wealth of wisdom that has come from your life experience and Excited to to see the book come out, The Bottom of the Pool. Where do you want people to to buy that book? From your website, through Amazon, local bookstore? Yeah, just Amazon or local bookstore or, you know, any, anywhere. And, and I would love for them to connect with me on andyandrews.com or on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, and okay. there's also, uh, you know, I have a podcast. It's not as big as yours, but it's it's called The Professional Noticer. And we do that weekly and 
have wisdomharbor.com. That's H-A-R-B-O-U-R. It's our, because it's not mine, it's ours. But that's a cool place, Wisdom Harbor. And um, I appreciate being with you, buddy. I appreciate you giving me the time. You bet. Well, thank you so much. And um, guys, leave him a Google review as well as even a book review on the new book that comes out once you read it or any other reviews from previous materials that he's written. So, yeah, pre- I would appreciate that. And be nice, be nice, you know, so. <laughs> well, Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, buddy. Take care. All right. So now I have some personal questions. Um, <laughs> okay. Just, you know, because how often do I get to talk with someone such as yourself? Well, more and more lately, but previously not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I guess several things. One, as someone who wants to be a public speaker and an author, what advice do you have? Man, the, the public speaking thing is you just got to do it. You got to do it. And people say, well, how do I do it? Well, in, your, in, your, in Tulsa, there are so many places begging for somebody to speak. And, and so here, will you let me know what those places are? <laughs> yeah. Listen, man, every rotary club, every rotary club in Oklahoma will have you. And, and so, so here's the thing though, when, when you say, you know, I have people say, well, I want to be a public speaker. Okay. Do you want to be a public speaker or do you want to get paid for it right away? You know, because if you want to get paid for it right away, and I'm not saying you, I'm just saying anybody, if you want to get paid for it right away, you're probably not great enough to get paid for it. All right. And the only way you get great enough to get paid for it is by doing it. And you do it enough times, I guarantee you, as you start to turn that curve and you're getting better and better and better, people are starting to say, hey, come talk to our club. Hey, come talk to our place. Well, then you have to charge just to separate the stuff, just to be able to do it. And then you have to raise your price just to separate the stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And, And so, but at first, you want to just go in and and create value. And man, look, you know, look at you. You you are ready. You have such an incredible credit with your podcast that you know, come up with the credits and and make that available to rotary clubs. I mean, because I'm telling you, all over Oklahoma, they're dying for people to talk. I I do them occasionally and 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 they're the best thing for uh, i mean i i'm telling you i did one four or five months ago had 11 people sitting there you know and i did it for free and it's uh you know i did it for a buddy but i i remember thinking where was this when i was starting hmm. But the answer was, they were right there. It is, nobody ever told me. And okay. so, so there's that. And as far as writing goes, it's almost the same thing. You just got to write. You got to write. And, and you want to get, get as good as you can. Now, I say as good as you can. I don't consider myself a great writer. I wasn't the best writer in my senior English class, Okay. Uh, but I learned how to tell a story. I learned how to put stuff together and, and you can do that. You can tell a story and you can put it down on paper. Just get, you know, just get good at it. Write about what you know, write about your family, write about podcasting, write about what you see, write about what you hear, what you think. And, you know, I mean, your only job is to make it interesting. Right. So two, two last questions. Uh, first question being, I love to collect autographed books. If I buy and send a, cu- a couple of your books to you, could you autograph them and mail them oh, back? You don't have to, oh, man, you don't have to buy them. Uh, hey, uh, man, throw me a Sharpie.
Okay. Yeah, yeah. E V A N, right? Yes, sir. All right. Let's see. I'll show you. And gonna have um, S B. My assistant will be here in just a little bit. And I can email her my address. Yeah. I, think I, I, I believe that's who I've been talking to. Yeah, it is. Okay, so we've got, there's the bottom of the pool. Sweet. And there's I'm, that. And then we got, there's the butterfly effect. When I started talking about it, Matt brought one in here. And there's that. Thank you. Oh. Absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. Last, last question. So I have a lot of different book ideas and I know there's one book that I I'm, really want to write, but I know it's going to be a two person, a two, two author book. And I've never told anyone this yet, but if this intrigues you, think about it or pray about it. I remember growing up wanting to be funny and and even to this day, I still have a desire to be somewhat comical. Sure. But it just doesn't come off sometimes as well as I want to. And <laughs> anyway, I, there was this moment when I was younger, when I was trying to tell a story, and I got to the punchline and no one laughed. And I was in a large group of my family members, and they all just looked at me like, that was dumb. And then the little boy of me then is just like, oh, I guess you had to be there. And then everybody erupted with laughter. And I've been thinking about it. So here, here's the idea of the book. It's called Find Your Funny. And it's about finding your, your, your humor, your inner comedic voice. Right. And, and you talked about previously being a comedian. Ideally, when I was thinking about this book, um, it was wanting to, to co-write a book with, with an author who, who has a comedy experience and – the point or the, the idea of the book is that you have the experienced and the mentee like learning to how to develop his community. Right. Voice. So right. Just, an, just an idea. That's a, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So I, and I, I will think about it. I, I'm just, I'm so many books behind. Right. You know, right now you probably want to get somebody else to do it. But that's a great idea, man. No, no worries. I, I thought I'd throw it out there. I didn't realize yeah. you were previously a, a comedian. Oh man. Yeah. They, I mean, you know, I got contracts of books I'm writing, right? I mean, in fact, I've got another manuscript due. Oh Lord. In like 40 days. So wow. anyway, Hey yes, buddy, sir. thank you so thank much. You. Absolutely. Have a great day. Absolutely. You, you are awesome. And so just make good hay with this and, and do speak. You, you'd be great at it. Thank you. I really All appreciate right. that. All right, man. You take care. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you would, I'd greatly appreciate you subscribing as well as rating and even leaving us an objective review. It helps us with our ratings and spreading the message of the Whole Person Podcast. And now, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Thank you guys so much for listening today. Take care and God bless.